All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM. Joining you as usual from a sunny San Diego. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Bob Carruthers, who is in Denver, Colorado. How are you doing, Bob? I'm doing great. Yeah, and Bob is your dedicated partner in leadership growth with over 28 ex years of experience in leadership development, executive coaching. Bob has guided CEOs and C-suite execs towards success and fulfillment. Uh, a six-time recipient of the Chair Excellent Award, his coaching is grounded in practical experience, offering valuable insights from his own entrepreneurial journey. And what we're going to talk about today is executive leadership and, and what that means and how that can uh, and how that can uh, be optimized to make uh, the biggest impact on whatever organization that executive leader may be working in. Um, so um, just just to get started, uh, uh, Bob, um, a lot of people default into executive leadership positions. You know, you get a career path and you, you get promoted, mm -hmm. et cetera. Mm -hmm. But I think the first time a lot of people are in a, an executive leadership position, uh, they're not fully prepared for it. There's, they're not given any training for it. They're not given any guidance for it. They're just said, here you go. Here's your new job. Away you go. And by the way, here's your colleagues on the exec team. That's absolutely right. It's when you're working in the plant one day and you find you're the, uh, the supervisor the next, mm -hmm. you know, and it's all the way up the chain. Yeah. So, and so, when when you work with when you work with the in individuals and organizations, how do you help guide or prepare people for their executive leadership journey? Well, I usually get involved with people that are pretty far up the chain. They'd mm -hmm. be CEOs or C-suite executives. I do work with some middle managers, um, and it's all about leadership. You know, we, that's what we do. We, we bring in speakers on leadership. I, you know, constantly we're asking different questions. You know, I, I run a peer group and it's not just me. That's it's 13 other CEOs in the room and they're sharing ideas on what they've done, what they've done to be better, where they've messed up, you know, so that they can help coach each other along the way. Mm -hmm. And it's very effective. Yeah. So, what's one of the most one of what what is one of the most what is what is one of the most common issues you see that I mean, if you're working with executives, obviously you've been tenured for a while, but the problem is, as I said, is often we end up in these positions, but we don't actually have a lot of fund the fundamental skills that we need because you know we just kind of are racing ahead. But uh, what what are one of the what's one of the common issues that you come across? Right now, it's finding good people. It's hiring, you know, it's uh, gotten really expensive because you have to almost always have to use a recruiter mm -hmm. to find the quality of people you're looking for. Um, and all the way down to the, the plant level or the, you know, whatever in the company. It's just, it seems like it's just very, um, very, not that many good candidates out there. Yeah. And, and so, and I mean, and that is obviously an incredibly uh, challenging situation. How do you how do you address that? Because I mean, I feel like today, uh, like you said, I mean, it's expensive to recruit people, but also today, like people have different expectations. There's different configurations of work, mm -hmm. etc. I mean, those days are kind of gone, where it was like you said, here, here's the job. You move within a commutable distance of of where this job is, and you come in every day or whatever. Now people are going, eh, yeah, I'll go, I'll go find something that really suits my lifestyle. So it, it's it's quite the challenge now as to how do you. How do you recruit people given the various different like uh, demands that they have? Yeah, you're absolutely right. It's gotten kind of crazy with this. Um, you know, it's it's also an opportunity because it's opened the whole United States as an mm -hmm. employee force. Yeah, remote a remote working force. How we handle it, or that my members are handling it, is they um, work to make their company as friendly employee friendly as they can you know they want a place where people want to work mm -hmm. they actually want a wait list to work there so things they've done to both the the uh, 
the uh, decorations, the interior design, um, all the way down to, you know, maybe four, four day work weeks, four mm -hmm. 10 hour days, um, Fridays off every other Friday off. I've seen, seen that. Yeah. And it's just a place to attract good employees because it's, it's a younger generation and they expect different things. Yeah. And I think on top of that, then the expectation is how long they're going to stick around because I've seen statistics now is the uh, millennials and that, you know, are, are you know, less than two years often in jobs and uh, you can know, cause they're constantly moving. So I think well, you, you have to realize that you may have a finite amount of time with these resources. Right. Right. It, in the way, you know, that's true. And, but I've seen companies that, um, by showing uh, interest in the employees and wanting to see them have a growth path and 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 invest in their training and their future, that they keep the keep the employees. You know, it's it's all it's all about making a place that people want to be and want want to have fun. They have to make a lot of friends. They do make a lot of friends at the company. And if they're fired up about what their job is and what the company's doing, then they are magnificent employees and they, they don't leave. Mm -hmm. And then uh, and a part of what you're describing there is obviously company culture. And I think uh, right. a lot of company, a lot of organizations, the culture of the company happens organically, accidentally, or it takes its cue from the leader. Mm -hmm. um, uh, whereas I, I think nowadays you have to you have to take a deliberate approach to to your company culture, understand what it is, understand maybe what you would like it to be, and get there. Because as you said, it, at the end of the day, it's the culture is probably the thing that's going to attract and maintain your your best employees. That's right. That's right. And it's not something that just happens. Mm -hmm. It has has to be designed and nurtured, and constantly talked about. Um, you know, I, I've got members that uh, give out pins or things to their employees, you know, for uh, honoring the different uh, standards of the company. And when another employee sees them living up to that, they give them a pin. Mm. So they'll, they'll have, it's a construction company, so they'll have a vest just full of pins, you know, um, just because they're always communicating it, always talking about it. It's on the walls, you know, right. it's, it's all over the place. And I think and what you described there is just something that's an interesting phenomenon because we're, we're great at catching people doing something wrong, right? We're great at catching right. mistakes. Right. We're very hardwired for, for some reason, like we can spot it a mile off. We're very bad at acknowledging when people are doing the right things. It's like catching people doing something right. And what you just described there is a fantastic example of of culturally or institutionally uh, catching people doing things right. Absolutely. And it's, it's uh, effective. It's crazy how it's one little pin changes behavior in the company. Yeah, no, no ab absolutely. Absolutely. And then the other, the other part, uh, one of the other things you mentioned there, uh, we talked about at the beginning was delegation. And that's something that seems to be, let's face it, a, a lot of people as they move up or find delegation a little more difficult because mm -hmm. you have to let number one you have to find the right people to delegate to but you also have to let people do things slightly differently than the way you would do it right or maybe very differently than the way you would do it absolutely and, and you can and if you delegate something but you kind of constantly are interfering or taking it back you're not really delegating either no, no you're micromanaging <laughs> you know delegation is hugely uh, important because if the CEO or the leaders want to do it all themselves, they're a huge roadblock to the success of the company. Mm -hmm. You know, delegation seems hard, but it's it's not. It's uh, you set clear expectations of what you need done with a clear timeline of when you need it, and you hold people accountable. Mm -hmm. If you say, "I need this report in by next Friday at 5 p.m." and you don't have it at 5 p.m., then you call the person in and say, what happened? Um, what got in your way? Uh, what are you going to do about it? When can you have this to me? And when will you commit to having it to me? 
Mm -hmm. And so by staying on them and having people understand that you are going to, you mean what you say, um, that practice just kind of helps it grow and become a a company that is a delegation based on delegation. Yeah. And and it's interesting what you said there about setting clear expectations, because I think that's the biggest complaint that people often have is when they get delegated something and then their manager Mm -hmm. takes it back or they're interfering stuff and they go, well, you didn't really explain that in the first place. Or I never really understood clearly what it was you wanted from me. And I think sometimes just because we've been doing something for a while Uh and we delegate it, we kind of assume that the other person is going to understand it at the level that we do, which is impossible. That's absolutely right. And if you just say, I need this report next week, mm-hmm. what does that really mean? It, you know, it could be Monday morning or fr- it's, if you say that, it's going to be Friday afternoon the soonest. And most likely they're going to wait till Monday or Tuesday. The mm-hmm. following week. Yeah. Um, uh, y- yeah. What? <laughs> And and the other part you mentioned as well is is risk taking, right? Uh, mm-hmm. And that's and and especially as we go through periods like this, you know, maybe when an uncertain economy and things is is taking people get very risk averse, right? Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. rather than seeing maybe there's an opportunity to take some calculated risk, but t- talk to me a little bit about leadership and risk in an entrepreneurial setting. Um, there's always risk especially for the top leaders. The CEO, if he's also the founder and the owner of the company, everything he's doing is a risk, Mm -hmm. you know, and it has to be very calculated and mitigated with insurance or whatever you can do. Um, But for an entrepreneur to start out, um, they must have a high tolerance for risk because you're going to put your house on the line most likely and you're going to, um, borrow money from family and friends and credit cards and anything you can do to get the company going. Mm-hmm. That's risky. And how do you manage that risk as you go for? I mean, just the, you know, the balance, the risk reward. You've just got to look at the, what the reward is and look at the amount of risk and how, what if it goes wrong? What are you going to do? Do you have plan B? Do you have plan C? Um, can you insure against it? Or can you involve others in it? Maybe you could um, have a company that you could lay part of it off on, let mm-hmm. them handle some of it, and you do the rest. Um, there's all kinds of ways, but it it's it has to be very calculated and managed. Yeah, no, absolutely. And then when you're working today with the with the other groups of leaders and and CEOs, are there any are there any issues that have you know over the last number of years have become bigger or maybe changed or i wouldn't say new because i mean there's they tend to be evolutions but what what is what is really occupying the minds of leaders right now well right now it's it's what we're talking about it's the remote workforce Mm -hmm. how do you maintain your culture in a remote workforce um how do you hire how do you train when people aren't in the office how can you have a sense of belonging if they're working out of their bedroom at home? Um, it's 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 that's all new to this. Yeah. It's the pandemic. So, what are some of the ways that people are are, are overcoming this? Uh, you know, building culture when people are, and it's not just remote, is it, Bob? Because uh, oftentimes now you have you have full-time employees who are remote, but then you often have contractors, maybe long-term contractors. They're not in your organization, but they have been around for a long time. So they're almost part of your organization. Right. And, then, and then you have maybe temporary people coming in and out, but how do you manage, how, how do you manage to build culture with all of that? What I'm seeing is it's a different kind. I mean, it's, it's, people are working more of a hybrid thing in mm-hmm. most of the companies I have. They'll be in the office, say two days a week and they'll be at home three days a week in those two days a week they'll do a company meeting they'll do often some kind of a company lunch or something Um, they talk about the company they talk about where it's going and you know what successes they're having Um, they spotlight certain employees for the outstanding performance Um, there's all kinds of ways they're doing it. 
And there's um, one interesting statistic that somebody gave me recently was that there are, I thought it was five, but they said there were six generations in the workforce today, first mm -hmm. time ever. And, and let's face it, people receive information in different ways we've got so many different ways of communicating today mm -hmm. um, as, as a as an organization and as a leader you have to recognize that among your employee base there's no such thing as a one size fits all communication anymore you have to communicate in in multiple different ways which is a challenge in itself oh it sure is and with technology, you know, I'm, I've been around a long time, so I'm up at the top end of the generational thing. And I'm not that good with technology. With, with uh, I'm a one-finger typer on my phone, um, but I get it done. And we're working with kids coming in that grew up. I mean, they were born with this stuff and had a cell phone in their hand when they were three, mm -hmm. um, typing and using the apps and adapting right now they're adapting to ai yeah um the older the older people are still trying to figure that one out you know they're arguing about whether it's a good thing or a bad thing and the younger ones are just rocking and rolling making it work no absolutely and i think that that is i think that is the challenge for for leadership is that you have to accept that uh, you have to accept that, yeah, different generations have adapted to things quicker and that uh, we can't be can't be a Luddite and try and like, you know, smash up the machines because guess what? They're here. you got to figure out how to leverage them. And I think that that opens up another aspect of leadership is especially today is the fact that expertise in your organization may lie in places where once upon a time it wouldn't. For instance, like you're saying, a young millennial is coming to the workforce may may be very up on AI in a way that the leadership team isn't. Now you have expertise in the organization that lies at the hierarchically at the bottom of the organization rather than the top. That's exactly right. And it's the, the millennials are kind of old fashioned now. It's the Zers and the ones beyond the Zers that are really into it. And and so you have to manage all of that. And um, you're right. It's often the expertise is not at the top of the, the, mm -hmm. the scale. Yeah. It's it's the younger people and that know how to work with this stuff and know think in a different way. They know they do things differently than we did. They have different ideas. They're not afraid to to take a chance and and risk. Um, look at the guys that started Airbnb and mm. and. Uh, you know, lift in those companies, um, just just amazing young people. Yeah, and that's why I said it's 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 leaders. You know, have to realize that you know there it is different now. You have to figure out ways of unlocking sure. and and harnessing harnessing that expertise in a way perhaps you wouldn't once upon a time have had to. That's right. Um, and adapt the organization. Uh, and then uh, just just finally, uh, Bob, I mean, AI, how much is AI occupying your leadership group right now? You know, they're, they're all using some form of AI in their business. Mm -hmm. I have one guy that's, I mean, his company is about technology and they've been using AI for five years. Mm -hmm. and so now it's gone to places that we never thought it would go. Um, I, the construction company I mentioned is using AI and and uh, doing plans and build you know building strategies and all kinds of stuff, and it's definitely here to play or to stay. It, I think it's a great asset, and it's only going to get better. Mm -hmm. And the speed of change is going to be a lot faster than it's been, and it's been crazy fast. Yeah, you yeah. Know? Oh, I think you're 100 percent right there. I think we haven't uh, we we don't even know what speed is yet. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Well, listen, Bob. This has been great. Thank you so much for joining us today. All of Bob's information will be below this video. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about you and what you do. I'm a Vistage chair, and if you haven't heard of Vistage, it's an international organization that takes top leaders in companies. We put them into peer advisory groups where we bring in as much diversity as we can in people, in ages, in gender, in races to uh, tackle the problems that are going on in business today. 
Um, in addition, I do coaching with each uh, CEO I have, and um, that helps too. So it's all we bring in outside speakers. So it's all geared to helping the leaders make better decisions and get better results. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. Well, listen, thanks again, Bob. I encourage you to go check out Bob, go check out Vistage and, uh, and see if maybe, uh, maybe there's a group near you that you might want to join. Uh, so thanks again, Bob. Thank you for watching and listening. I'll see you again very soon.